You're listening to City of Muses on Paris Underground Radio. Welcome back to City of Muses on Paris Underground Radio. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. I'm a screenwriter, filmmaker, and the creator and founder of the Paris Underground Radio Podcast Network. Each week, I sit down with an artist or creative to talk about what inspires them, what their creative process is like, and how Paris plays into it all. I'm very excited to bring you this week's guest. He's a young African-American artist who is just about to graduate from the Yale School of Arts, and he will be having his very first solo exhibit in Paris this Thursday, March 28th. I'm talking about Khalif Tahir Thompson. Khalif is a painter, printmaker, and papermaker who creates bright, bold portraits mixing textures, colors, and symbols on large-scale canvases. Khalif has been called a prodigy, a virtuoso, and a rising star in contemporary Black portraiture. His exhibit, Chilly Winds Don't Blow, opens this Thursday, March 28th, in the Zadun Bastiat Gallery. You are all cordially invited to the opening, I'll be there, which begins at 6.30. The exhibition itself will run through May 11th. Please, without further ado, allow me to introduce Khalif Tahir Thompson. Hello, Khalif. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hello. I'm happy to be here. So I'm very excited to talk to you because I know that you have a show opening here in Paris in just a couple of days at the Zadun Bastiat Gallery, and I'm very excited to talk to you all about that. Before we get into that, can you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure, sure. Yes, um, I'm very excited to be in Paris. And my name is Khalif Tayyar Thompson, and I'm a painter, printmaker, papermaker, and a uh, all around loyal uh, <laughs> artist. <laughs> Anyways, yes, I'm an artist, a visual artist. I am based in New York. I'm currently studying painting and printmaking at the Yale School of Art, which I will be graduating in May. So this is a huge year for me. It's a big year. And this uh, show in Paris is the title of the show is Chilly Winds Don't Blow. And it's going to be, yeah, my first solo exhibition in Paris. So I'm really excited. That's incredibly exciting. That's a lot of big events happening all at once. So yeah, among other things. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you're taking a little bit of time to let it actually soak in all that's happening. Yeah, I think that's going to happen this week. I, I think it's kind <laughs> of like, it was like, it's been so much preparing and so much just um, work and just to kind of staying motivated, staying ambitious and staying involved while taking care of myself and making sure that I smell good and things like that. Right. <laughs> yeah, I sort of imagine you'll need a big like spa day once all of this ends. Oh, I just had one. I, I got a manicure, pedicure, facial, and I got my <laughs> teeth white. Good for you. Thank you. <laughs> so I want to hear about how Khalif came to be. Did you come from an artistic household? Totally, totally. Yeah. No, my household was very artistic. My mother was just very much involved. I have two brothers and two sisters. Oh, wow. Um, so oh. there's five of us all together and all of us. I have a twin sister of those sisters, actually. So I'm a twin, a fun fact. But everybody was always involved in something creative. My brothers actually both went to art high school. And um, they're about six, eight years older than me. So around the time that I was like, you know, around seven and eight, you know, they were all starting high school or in high school. And um, that was my first introduction to an art institution, an art format, even though they always drew. My sister sang. My sister, my twin sister was a creative writer. So she was into poetry. And so we always did all kinds of programming. And I did a lot of classes at Brooklyn Museum. It kind of just was immersive for me, always in art. You know, it wasn't necessarily painting, but like art spaces. I think it was more of a natural inclination. I was inclined towards painting and drawing because I primarily drew, obviously, you know, with my number two pencil and my <laughs> composition notebook and all those things. So it was kind of like just a real artistic upbringing, a lot of different, you know, 
tap dancing, chorus, you name it. We did a lot of things, but I really always was focused and very serious about my drawing and you know my art. So it's really interesting having these older siblings. You must have thought that homework was like going to this artistic high school. You must have thought that homework was always something artistic versus like calculus. Oh yeah, no, totally. I mean, I I, I only saw their assignments. Like I remember they were had to draw this Michelangelo. It's my first time seeing like Michelangelo. So they would um, draw from them for class. And then I would get those assignments because I would be competitive at the time. I was always competing. <laughs> so I would try and mimic their drawings of Michelangelo. And so I would just, you know, draw, 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 draw and all that. So it was like a real addiction in the beginning and uh, just an excitement about, you know, being like, wow, you can go to school and be in art class. And art class was like for most artists, you know, was like a haven. I mean, I really wasn't that good with, you know, math and I got much better with my reading, but I was like, you know, very much a uh, observational uh, learner and kid. You know, I was very a slow learner. So I was like very much. But when I was good at something, which was that I was like drawing, that is, and art and just different arts and crafts. I was like, I'm going to focus on this and there's classes for it. So this is a great way for me to get some brownie points for parent-teacher conference day <laughs> and, you know, at least something they'll be like, oh, Khalif, you know, didn't do too well in his math exam, but he's excelling in art. So it was like always a polarizing <laughs> situation, but I got much better with my academics as college came around, but yeah. <laughs> was there ever, do you remember a moment where you thought to yourself when you were creating something or you had just created something where you thought, you know what, I'm good at this. I think this is a thing I could do. Mm-hmm. Yep. I was four years old, maybe three or four, actually. I remember it was like I couldn't even reach the top of the fridge. I mean, it was very, <laughs> you know, one of those situations. And I remember I had drawn Scooby-Doo. I was like, draw, I think I drew from a, a cereal box. And I just sat and just like, you know, really meditated. Who knows how well it was now? It's like a distant memory. But I just remember thinking, wow, I did this really well. Like, I, I drew Scooby-Doo. Like, you know, it was exciting because, you know, then it was like being able to draw cartoons like was instant popularity in preschool and kindergarten. Like you could draw SpongeBob. Like that was my big thing in elementary school. <laughs> no, because it was like it was SpongeBob was the biggest thing. So if you could draw SpongeBob, they'd be like, oh, can you draw a SpongeBob, you know, wearing a flamenco hat, you know, those kind of things. And so but yeah, it was this one moment where I drew Scooby-Doo and my mother put it on the fridge and I was like, wow, proud achievement. Like, you know, <laughs> it was like my first showcase. I guess, in a way. But that was the earliest memory I had where I was like, oh, I'm doing something and it's appreciated. <laughs> That's a fabulous memory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how did you discover your love for painting then? That was much later. I mean, well, drawing is the foundation for painting. So how I look at it now was because like, I didn't start painting until I was um, around 16. I studied at LaGuardia High School of Music and Art. So it was a specialized high school, majoring in art. I auditioned with a portfolio of drawings and I got into there. It was like a real, like, you know, you're with other people that are talented at art. And I actually went to school with Timothy Chalamet. Ooh. Yeah, he was a, he was a drama major, but shout out to Timothy if he's listening. <laughs> but yeah, it was definitely um, just like a really, like, it was a performing arts high school. So there was so much singing and dancing. I mean, it really was like that movie fame that uh, from the 70s, it was like a very like inspirational setting. And so, uh, and I was also going through a really hard time, you know, high school, it was just like a very hard time, just like getting adjusted, affording supplies, keeping up with assignments and academic rigor with the arts rigor, you know, I was always really natural with the art thing. So I was always kind of like, you know, I always did well there. The only reason I would uh, not do well because I couldn't afford supplies or I couldn't do a project or things like that. So it was very difficult. And I think it was like my idea, yeah, my junior year, and uh, I was placed in advanced oil painting. I don't know why, because I had never made a painting. <laughs> but I don't think I, I, I took an acrylic course the year before. And I don't think I, I didn't really like acrylic. I didn't know why I didn't like it. But when I got to the oil painting class, you know, besides talking and gabbing with my friends and just goofing off, my teacher was like, you know, I think you should, you should try and do a painting. You know, <laughs> this is a painting class and, was, <laughs> and you're just like gabbing all day. And, and I would always just be in my sketchbook too. So I would always be drawing, but 
I was like less motivated towards painting. I didn't know if I could do it. I didn't think I could really do it. But my first painting was actually of Amy Winehouse. It was the, that year because it was the year she passed. And I loved Amy Winehouse. And I was like, you know, something was like almost like, you know, honorific. That's how I did my drawings. Everything was always very honorific. And, you know, I mean, I come from like caricature artists, New York City. You see paintings of celebrities all the time or drawings of celebrities. And But it was something that was personal to me where it was like, you know, I, I really loved Amy. I was like, I want to do a painting of her. It was a small, small, small canvas. And um, I worked on that small, small canvas and that one project for like three months. It was like the whole. Wow. Yeah, it was like I was just perfecting it, like trying to get it right. And mind you, I didn't take a class. I didn't know how to mix colors or, you know, I think initially I had painted her and she looked almost like chalky white. Like I didn't understand mixing the flesh. Like I had to really develop a relationship with color and the paint and material. And, um, but ev- eventually like I got it to a great place where, you know, cause then she was an orange Oompa Loompa. Cause I started, <laughs> you know, then I was just like, I couldn't get the skin tone, but it, it was just layer through layer. And then it, you know, I was really happy with it. And that was my first painting. Is that still hanging somewhere? I have it. There was many a time where I could have lost it and I'm glad I didn't. Because it was actually that painting that gave me my first entrance. I got this Daedalus scholarship for art portfolio. And it was like $2,000, you know, crazy money then for me. I was like, I was just on the moon because I wasn't doing that well in school. But I was like, you know, I'll be passing. But I was just like, wow, like I'm doing something good. You know, like I was like being merited. I'm, I, I really need awards and stuff. I, <laughs> I like them. <laughs> it tells me that I'm on the right track and it's encouraging. So that was like a huge encouragement for me. And um, just with those paintings and it was very raw. I mean, I was painting in the dark. I mean, I, I really wasn't following any of the rules. Not at all. So it was like I had a really organic <laughs> painting beginning because it was there was no classes or anything like that you know but sometimes that's attributed to the kind of work I make that it's kind of academic in a certain way and I did go to institutions but yeah it was was very I was self-taught I mean I really just you know obviously was influenced by a lot but it was just me and the paint (laughs) amazing so how did the paper making come to be So that was in my undergraduate studies. I studied at Purchase College, also majoring in painting. I actually transferred in. And I think it was in my sophomore year, I began, they just offered it. It was the first time they offered the paper making. And I don't know why I was just very much attracted to it. I always been was interested in, at that point, collage and using like handmade tactile material. I just like the idea of um, creating something that you can use. So it's like my same, you know, fetishism with farming and, you know, making your own bread or something. I just was like, oh, like make your own paper. Yeah. Like, let's do that. You know, not knowing that it was such a, I mean, it's, it's not easy, but it's definitely a pretty straightforward process. I thought there took a lot. There is, I guess it's it's a complex process, but it it was something that was accessible, I guess. And so when I took the class, I instantly just enjoyed it because it was like this fun way to not paint, but create something that was very much coming from my hand and my handle and my technique and that process and getting my hands in the pulp and uh, mixing these different colors and cutting them up and doing different things with them. It just became uh, an integral part of how I worked just technically um, and how I started thinking and processing shapes and forms and textures and things like that. That started with the collage and the paper making. Mm -hmm. Have you always dreamed of owning a place in Paris? If you're planning on moving, renting, buying, or selling a place in France, you'll need the expert guidance of Gail Boisclair and Marie Pissinier, hosts of the Paris Estate of Mind podcast. Listen now to Paris State of Mind on parisundergroundradio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with City of Muses after a word from our sponsors. And now back to City of Muses on Paris Underground Radio. And so this is how your current style evolved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was almost like I would just take things on my way in my journey. I guess, yeah, oil painting 
And painting in general is something I took from high school. You know, that was like, I was like, oh, I took that. And then when I got into undergrad and I started learning so much about contemporary art and more about art history, I minored in art history. Um, I was in a number of, you know, African-American art history classes and just becoming privy of artists that I never had heard of beforehand in high school and stuff that I've seen, you know, we've seen Jacob Lawrence, you don't know, you're looking at Jacob Lawrence and um, Ramar Bearden. And um, it was through my college years that I really started, you know, developed a palette of the work I like and what I could do and, you know, what I can contribute or what, where I thought I fit. And I, yeah, it took me, it wasn't until my under, I mean, my college years that I actually first saw, I remember Kehinde Wiley's solo exhibition at Brooklyn Museum. I took a field trip there. It was the first time I'd seen so many Black figures in paintings and just in this hugely, like, extravagant, flamboyant, very, um, yeah, aristocratic way. It was, like, so beautiful. And there was sculpture. And I was like, oh, God, like, this is insane. Like, I, I take, you know, how long in one painting? So I can't imagine this, how long this would take if I were to do this. But I was just like, yeah, like, I was just taken back from that. So more and more, I started to, you know, hear more about the Jennifer Packers and the Toy Mitchies and the, you know, Nina Chanel's and all the giants in contemporary Black art, but just art in general. I found out about Alice Neal in college. So I, I kind of took, I think, more art history and the papermaking and just process from my college years and out. So, and now I'm in graduate school. So I, I have stuff I've taken here, but it's not over yet. So I don't want to <laughs> conclude it. <laughs> and I noticed that a lot of your work is portraiture. Is that something that you were always attracted to? Well, yeah, I mean, that's how it started. You know, it was that, that first painting of Amy Winehouse. Before that, it was always portraits I was drawing in my notebook. It was Madonna. It was Helena Bonham Carter. It was everybody. I think I wasn't so much thinking so much. I mean, obviously, I was thinking about the subjectivity, but more than anything, an excuse to do a portrait was always just like very enjoyable to me. And looking back, I mean, I always was attracted to a lot of the American art and the portraiture and the prestige and the, you know, the formalism that was involved in classical work. And it was kind of like something I always aspired to that I wasn't trained in. So it was it kind of shows up in the work because like how I did portraits was very much what we understand as more impressionistic, more expression, less smoothed out. But that was just actually just how my painting upbringing started. It was just through looking at portraits and um, seeing paintings and trying to emulate it, then dropping it all together, you know, or and just being more empowered by how I did things, you know, embracing more the imperfections or just like the way I work, finding my voice really through the paint was through portraiture. It's super interesting. When you're creating a piece, I know a lot of these come from photographs. How much of the final piece do you have mapped out when you begin? Not a lot. I mean, I started working with photographs from my family albums in the last two or three years. And it kind of coincided with my interest in making a certain type of painting. And I kind of like through this program kind of started thinking more about what I was attracted to within the photographs that I saw in paintings or what I thought could be paintings or translated in a certain way. But because of my process of collage and the paper and the material and how I paint, you know, it was more so, I never know actually how it's going to, the composition is relatively faithful to the photograph and it follows that kind of archival image composition, you know, the foreshortening and the way you see it. And so it takes you to a family photograph initially. But what I wanted to do was bring you through that and just kind of start that as an anchor and build upon these different things that are uncanny. And it's like, you know, it's familiar, but it's also unfamiliar. You know, these spaces don't give away exactly what time they were taken. Or sometimes you'll have hairstyles as clues or maybe some clothing or something like that that might do that for you. But I, I'm strategic in what I choose to give and what I take away and how I can transform the image. You know, that's where the exterior meets the interiors. And a lot of these family photographs are in domestic spaces. And so I opened them up. There's these imagined landscapes and there's these different, you know, formalist collage elements. And they kind of take you to art history. And I mean, at least for me, and, but it's very unplanned. Yeah, it's like uh, I get that. I do the portrait, which is, you know, 
like the, again, the anchor for the piece. At least as it stands in certain compositions, you know, I started working with interiors without figures as well, but it's about reflecting on the image and then seeing what comes of it. You know, usually it starts with just the tone. Like I start with the tone, a bit like riffing like jazz. It's kind of like a jazz riff, you know. You do a bold thing, you have to complement it, and then you're kind of like, before you know it, like you just put the source material next to the painting and they look completely different in viewing them. They're like completely different resonances. So it's kind of um, come out that way. And actually, that leads me really naturally to my next question, because this new exhibit that's coming here in just a couple of days to our beautiful City of Light, it's called Chilly Winds Don't Blow, which I believe is the name of a Nina Simone song. Yes, yes, yes. And I also noticed that your past couple of collections also have titles that are taken from song titles as well. Yeah, no, it's interesting because... One, it's very useful. I mean, there's a few artists that do that as well. You know, it's kind of funny how painters, sometimes we have a, like, we actually have a real connection with music almost in a certain way. You know, I always considered oil painting to the equivalent of the piano. When you're putting an arrangement together and you're playing with these different tones, these different keys, and you can access every relationship in paint through oil and through just the chemistry itself it's like you can really go really deep and heavy or really light and airy and so it's kind of like how I think about titles and so sometimes when I don't have just a title already it might be a song that I've been listening to while creating the work over and over and or or it'd be like something that narratively I think fits or something that just I think complements the work or I really need to rush and title something because I can't name <laughs> everything untitled. So it's a, it's a mix, but the song choice, um, particularly for the show, but yeah, it kind of came together through listening to that song. But I kind of like the title, just how it flows, Chilly Winds Don't Blow. I kind of heard the song, but I was kind of like, you know, hmm, what does that actually mean? And so I started thinking about that. And to me, it was kind of about, it gets better. To me, it kind of worked... And like how I create work, I've heard a lot of people share their view of complexity in the work, where it's almost like very nuanced relationship between expression and pose and spaces and like melancholy versus, you know, joy. And so this kind of complexity and I wanted the title to kind of reflect that kind of nuanced complexity of both, you know, something that was affirmative, but also speaks to life and its challenges and moving through something and going to a safe place where chilly winds don't blow, you know, and it's like, it's not, uh, you don't mind. It gets better. I could see that. I listened to the song in preparation of this. I listened to the song and looked at your artwork and I can see the connection because the colors that you use are typically these big warm colors, reds and oranges and pinks and yellows, and it feels quite warm. And the people in your paintings, they don't always look like they're in the happiest position. Sometimes they're sleeping, sometimes they're just waking up. But all of this color around them, this warmth around them, it feels a bit like a hug that you're looking at. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's welcoming. You know, I think that's a lot having to do with the palette. I mean, with this show, I'm actually most proud versus some of my other bodies of work I'm working with the photographs. I'm really excited about the use of color in this show. Um, I think it's like I became a, a much better, in my opinion, better colorist and my building these relationships and using color more strategically in the works. Trying to, I'm always trying to not be too indulgent as a painter. You know, I think all of us have a tendency to kind of want to embellish and embellish and make beautiful. And, you know, I have that as well. It's typical of my sign you know, being Virgo and Libra, the sign of beauty and her Venus. So I kind of like, I'm aware of these things while working and try to just always complement something with something rough, with something soft, you know. All my favorite works of art have always kind of had this duality of in this balance. And you have to step back as well, even though you're invited to go in and see the details and be invited with the warmth and trying to discern the stories and you know, or relate to them, you know, which I've heard a lot, which I think is through the format of the family photograph. I mean, everyone has those. I mean, of every race, you know, everyone knows a family photograph, that format, you know, but building that relationship through the language of image 
and the use of color is kind of what I think adds to the overall ambiance and the presence of the work. And that's something that I am very much concerned with. And I think it's going to take a lot of different forms moving in the future. It's really interesting. I can see that the the warmth of it sort of makes the pictures a little bit more universal, even a little bit more that we can all relate to them rather than it's your particular family photo. Right. I always like, I remember a professor here, you know, he referred to them almost as these open signifiers, you know, they're kind of, there's a space within them where they are characteristic, they're indicative of a family photo, but they're also almost like a tarot card. Another friend of mine had stated that, you know, they kind of read where they, um, the pose is so important. And then the the gaze or the lack of gaze or the, the vantage point, you know, all these things lend themselves to understanding. It's reflective, you know, the images are very reflective and it takes you to a internal space, but also brings you through the collage and the different materials and the different elements into this more open space of exploration or just understanding like you know what am i looking at you know it's like i i i understand but then i don't understand exactly the narrative of this painting you know but you do know that the paintings are self-possessed in a way they have like a self-knowledge or knowing themselves you know i think they kind of refer to that to a confidence on my part and part of moves i made in the work but I think that was always very important to me to kind of have something not be so open and closed book, you know, something that you really can go through chapters in a work and stay looking at it. (laughs) That's my big concern. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm very excited to see these in person. Is this your first solo exhibit in Paris? Yes, it's my first solo exhibit in Paris. Yeah, I always, it's insane too, because I, I mean, I always, 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 always wanted to do, I mean, go to Paris. You know, I've been there a few times now, I can say, but, you know, I never thought that I'd have, you know, a solo exhibition so soon after my studies. And yeah, no, it's a real honor and privilege. And I'm super excited. I think it's like, you know, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be the first show that my mother has seen my solo exhibition that is in person. So I think it's going to be really exciting. I'm kind of just been preparing, (laughs) as I've said, you know, and waiting to be able to drop the shoulders and just take it all in once the show opening begins, you know, and just, you know, let loose and just feel all the love. And hopefully not the hate, but. <laughs> no, your your work is beautiful and the space is really beautiful too. So I'm sure that the two complement each other very, very well. And just to reiterate for our listeners, the opening is going to be this Thursday. So just if you're listening when this comes out, just two days away at the Zadun Bastiat Gallery. And I believe it starts at 6.30 p.m., but the exhibit itself will run through mid-May. So if you come to the opening, you'll get to see Khalif. I intend to be there as well, but you can always see the stuff later on. And maybe you can meet Khalif's mom. (laughs) You definitely will. She'll be very loud and in the front, and she'll say hi to everyone that walks in. So... Are you a book lover who's always looking for the next best book? Or an avid reader who'd love the chance to ask their favorite author a question? Well, then you might like my other podcast, Storytime in Paris, where I interview writers with a French connection, with questions that come from you, the author's fans and followers. Then the authors treat us to a reading from their books. Listen now to Storytime in Paris on parisundergroundradio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with City of Muses after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to City of Muses on Paris Underground Radio. As I understand it, you've also created your first monograph for this exhibit. Yes, yes. So the, here it is right here, actually. This is the Ooh. copy of it. But yeah, this is yeah my first monograph. We worked three months on it. And it has just, just like, you know, installation views and all my work in the, you know, since my undergraduate period, you know, and there's details and studio shots from this very studio and interviews. So it's kind of like a time capsule and it actually reads to me like an album, you know, it's kind of like a real, um, like this is my first painting when I got back out of 
undergrad and I got home to my mom's apartment and I did this painting there and it was of her and my my nephew and I was in you know 2019 so it's like kind of like a, t- a time capsule and so it's like a great beginning and I'm very happy I did it with Skira and it is available it's definitely available in Paris right now it's at the Pompidou I know cool which is great and um, I think Barnes and Noble as well but, but it's online if you it's on Amazon too and this is just a pitch for the book. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Go buy my book. <laughs> yeah, buy the book. Also come see Khalif's exhibit, see him in person, come to the opening. So in addition to this exhibit, where can people find you if they want to keep up to date with what you're doing, with what's going on in your world? Sure, sure. Um, right now online, my Instagram platform, which is my first and middle name, at Khalif Tayyir. That's K-H-A-L-I-F-T-A-H-I-R. That's my Instagram handle. And um, that's where I've been posting most of the most, I mean, the my updates and things like that. I'll be working on a, a website that will hopefully launch this summer. Other than that, you can also find me at uh, the galleries page, the Don Basud Gallery. So it will be um, up there. So, yeah. That's where I am. (laughs) Excellent. Well, I will include links to your Instagram and I will include links to the gallery as well so that everybody knows exactly where to go so they can find you and your work. Thank you so much, Khalif. This was such a pleasure and I'm very much looking forward to meeting you in person. I can't wait. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to City of Muses. If you've liked what you heard, please take a moment to rate and review it. This is the fastest and easiest way to help support the podcast. Tell a friend who could use a little inspiration. You can also subscribe to the Paris Underground Radio newsletter over on our website, parisundergroundradio.com, which comes out every Sunday and gives a little peek into what's on the network for the week ahead. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. You can find me on all socials at Jenny Foria. That's J-E-N-N-Y-P-H-O-R-I-A. Thank you for listening, and may you find inspiration wherever you go. City of Muses was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio.